customized help for whatever your company may need, whether it's business planning, developing your business model, we provide networking, we, and uh, another one of our core strengths here is we provide an awesome mentor team and mentor advisory experience for anybody who wants to grow. So if you have any questions, if you have a company or you're thinking about starting or growing a company, please come talk to us about the hub. Again, we're a business and technology incubator here in town. Okay, with that, um, we'd like to go ahead and go into a, one, an introductory video on One Million Cups. One Million Cups is a weekly it's a place where entrepreneurs can come and connect with the community. There's a real kind of vibe or a real energy here that's about supporting entrepreneurs. We have two presenters each week, two entrepreneurs, and they come and tell about their journey. They each have about six minutes to present. You're telling people what you're up to, and you're essentially getting feedback from them. So that's One Million Cups. It was started by the Kauffman Foundation with the idea of helping and promoting entrepreneurship and networking. As the video said, every week we bring in two local entrepreneurs to tell us their story, how they got started, their trials, their tribulations, their successes. And then as uh, we have a 15 minute Q&A, and that's the real value add for the entrepreneurs. They've all told us. We get such great feedback, we've gotten some really great ideas, taking our business in new directions or trying new things. And so don't be afraid to get in the weeds with the presenters and where you, when you get to ask the questions. That's a real value add to them. Uh, who's here for the first time? Please show of hands. Wow, awesome, that was a good first time turnout. Welcome everybody. Uh, please make sure that you sign in, it's very important and I'll talk about that again during the announcements. So uh, I'd like to shout out to our sponsors, our delicious coffee in the back is by uh, Krispy Kreme, Krispy Kreme Coffee, please get some of that. Our venue sponsor, the Hub of Human Innovation, and our media sponsor is Borderline TV and Digital Bull, although they couldn't make it here today, um, but that's who they are. Please download the mobile app for One Million Cups and you can check in on the mobile app. Also has a feature where you can provide feedback to the presenters after the fact. Uh, please join the com community for One Million Cups and also for the Hub. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I'll get into our first uh, presenter, the Grub Hub. Grub Hub. One Grub Community. One Grub Community, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is how they got it. I will say this. What I kept sticking in my mind was meatless brunches. I really like that name, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. So some things come up second, and then you end up liking them better, but you've already started on a team, right? And so we'll get into that. Hi everybody, so I'm Roman Wilcox, my wife is Adriana Wilcox right there, and she doesn't be standing in front of people unless she's selling product. So she's going to hang back there, but she's a wealth of information that we'll be able to, we'll be able to destroy her during the uh, talk. Okay, so, One Road Community and Meatless Merchants. Uh, we are El Paso's first 100% plant-based food business. We have a pay-it-forward purpose. And we're here to serve the tastiest meals and homemade grocery products for our community, no matter their circumstance. Where do I? Oh, here we go. Who the heck are we anyways? So I just introduced myself. I'm Roman, and my wife is Adriana. We've been married 16 years. We have two daughters, 13 and 6, and we're doing this thing. Uh, I am a <laughs> chef, <laughs> and I've been a chef for 22 years. Um, mostly here in El Paso, a little bit in Arizona, and my wife has a background in business. She has a business management degree. She has worked with the city for five years where I proceeded to yank her um, from her career there and take her on with me full time back in November. And she's basically everything that's just not the food. So I can cook, she can do everything else. And um, we're a pretty good team, thankfully. This is an example of one of our menus that we do every single week. We change our menus, we're seasonal, we're local, and we're 100% plant-based. All right, and we are in partnership with the Farmer Growers Co-op down at the downtown um, Artists and Farmers Market. Basically, that is a place where multiple farms can come and drop off their produce, and the interns with the city uh, basically sell it for them, and they are able to go off and sell in other places and produce more, make more money and stuff like that. Our job is we're the fiscal sponsors of that, so we basically run the books for them, 
pay out the farmers, and at the end of the day, we get to have some great partnerships with them that I'll talk about right now. So, a couple of facts, and this is kind of the stuff that started stirring for us and what we got involved in, okay? Uh, did you know that 30% of El Paso County residents live in food deserts? Did you guys know that? 30%. I, I kept telling everybody, tell all my people 20, 25%. According to the 2013 El Paso Health Report, it's 30%. Okay, we all live in food deserts, guys. That compares to 15% of Texas, Texans all around, and 9% of all U.S. residents. So we're really high on the scale of food deserts here in town. Basically what that means is that residents live in areas of low access to fresh food or a supermarket or grocery store. If you can't walk to a grocery store or to a, to, um, a fruit stand or something where fresh food is within a half a mile, you're considered to live in a, in a food desert. So, because not everybody has cars, not everybody has a bus card, right? So if you can't have access to it, you're going to have what, access to convenience stores, to chips, sodas, things like that. It's a kind of a nasty cycle. <coughs> Diabetes. It's increasing in our city. According to the health report again from El Paso, in 2010, over 12% of El Paso County residents uh, reported being told by a physician that they had diabetes. So that's a 15% increase between 2007 and 2010. I don't know what our data is, but I have a feeling that we're growing still. <laughs> El Paso has been voted the most charitable city in America. Um, according to CNBC, a whopping 92% of our adult population has made some form of charitable donation. 87% of that population is specifically to churches. Well, that's a really good thing, you know, Pastors can talk themselves on the shoulder for that. So this is where we get to our pay it forward concept. What does that mean? I'm sure, have you, anybody heard of pay it forward? Raise your hands. Yeah, you see, it's a beautiful thing that we're all knowing what that means, right? So, how do we do it? 5% of all of our sales, off the top, plus 100% of our tips, go straight into our PIF fund, okay? So that's our PIF jar, which we lost a couple weeks ago due to a windy day. Yeah, you know. And so we got to get a new one. <laughs> I think we have a basin jar. Up. And uh, that gets filled in at least every service. We were a food truck for three months. We can get into that later. We were getting 15 to 20% of our sales price and tips. And now we do about 10% even at our farmer's market stand. So people really do pay it forward and do care. Um, we have a local ice cream company right here, the Ice Cream for Myself Girls. Dom and AJ, they are uh, little heaven sent angels on earth for us. And they volunteer with us, but they also donate 50% of all their tips that they make at any of their events. And any of their unused product goes to it, whether it's an ice cream, a test batch, or their egg whites um, that they don't use in their ice cream, and then we're able to do outreach with them. Uh, let's see. In partnership with the Farmers Market Co-op, which we just discussed earlier, um, and local farms that are part of that, their unsold produce has been getting donated to us, and that's been, we're going, what, three, four weeks strong on that now? That's a new one. This is a couple of examples of what we do with our Pay It Forward funds. We have our vegan burrito outreach, okay, where we've actually just made 75 burritos, potato, homemade soy riso, kale, pop them in a beautiful tortilla, throw them in a cooler, and then just go start delivering to the homes of the Opportunity Center, the Veterans Home, the Women's Home, the Casa de, de Abuelitas, all the different places, and we just make sure that we get pure plant food into these folks that don't have access to it. Even if it's one time, let's just something. We're just trying to chip away at that green access. Uh, we have a quiche for the homeless. That's when we get so much egg whites from the ice cream girls and we have so much vegetables from the produce. We just have to do something with it. So we made quiche for 112 homeless men for the Opportunity Center, what, last week or the week before? And um, we have, uh, when we had a food truck, we had a breakfast pop-up at the women's shelter where we fed about 75 women just a really hearty meal. Um, and this is all money just from the community going right back to the And then Cookie with Casa Vida, Annunciation House, we're really excited about that. They have a meal time at the Annunciation House and at the Casa Vida for every day that's cooked by the people there with only donations. So we're going to take donations and then we're going to have the opportunity to start cooking with them so I can start introducing clean cooking and just take our food and stuff like that. So, why plant-based food? When it comes to diabetes and other diet-related health issues, plant-based diets have been known to bring people into healthier places and off medications as fast as two weeks. 
Okay, in El Paso, there are zero guys, that's right, zero plant-based vegan restaurants. Our community as a whole is ready for this food, and it's just really good food. We encourage you just to taste it, and we have some for you to taste. Where are we located? We currently have a stand at the El Paso Downtown's Art and Farmer's Market. We also are set up at the new bi-weekly Eastside Farmer's Market. We'll be there this Sunday. And then we're currently looking for a space to build our pay-it-forward plant-based deli, cafe, and grocery concept. And you can find us on the on Facebook and Instagram at One Grub Community and at our really janky website that we're working on at www.onegrubcommunity.org. And I think I hit it. Perfect. <laughs> So, we have Wifey, please come with me. <laughs> there you go. Yay. So, we had a food truck. We started October 29th with our first um, event at the Dead Beach um, uh, Brewery. Yeah, Dead Beach Brewery, but they had a block party. They had a block party, and that was our first event. We had a food truck. We had the opportunity to have that food truck for about three months. Uh, it was breaking down a lot. So it didn't work, we ended up giving it back to the leaser, and then basically we had to do something. We had already started, and then my wife, mind you, stopped working at the city on November 29th, 28th, exactly one month into our three month venture of that food truck. So we needed to do something, right? And the coordinator of the farmer's market said, hey, that seitan that you guys were making, which is a plant-based protein that's really good for you and has more protein to beef, and blah, 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 and all this stuff. She's like, you should just sell that at the farmer's market. So we did that, we made an Alfredo made out of cashews, and then we did um, our jerky, which we still sell to this day, and we started with three products at the farmer's market, kind of like, oh, and started selling out. Within four weeks, we were up to 14 products doing meals and groceries. So no, we're not a truck anymore, but we're a full market. So how'd you come up with the idea again? Well, so I, I've been a chef for 22 years. Um, I, out of those years, 10 of them, I was an educator uh, on the high, in the high school level and as well as the college level, uh, teaching culinary arts. And in that time, just to make things interesting for my kids and my students, I started looking into just food systems. At that time, Food Inc. came out. Um, a couple of different, I just started learning more about the way food was being produced here in, in, uh, in uh, America. And it kind of started doing something to me. Then I had an opportunity where I got to work at a really special little place here in town called the Mushroom Tea Cafe. And I was the opening chef there, and it's a nonprofit pay it forward cafe. And we had joined forces because some mutual friends had heard us saying the same things on different ends of the spectrum. So we got together, and I ended up opening that place with them um, as their chef. And I worked there for two years, and there I started making really heavy vegetarian based food. We had a lot of volunteers and donations from farms. So I had to work with vegetables and I loved it. And then the vegans and vegetarians started climbing out of the woodworks and we're just like, yes. And so it was this beautiful match. Like, hey, I like making this, you like eating it, something's happening here. And I started taking more of an interest after that. Um, kind of went on this crazy journey and decided I have to do this for myself. So when we started as a food truck, we were not plant-based. We were like 90% plant-based. I just liked the food, but I had some chicken. When we went to the market, I said, you know what? I'm not bringing any proteins. We're just gonna make it all plant-based. Let's see what happens. And it just popped. We sell out every week. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, it sounds like you guys are getting a positive response from the uh, community. You're seeing uh, a <coughs> plans for growth. And what steps are you taking right now to achieve that? So, um, I kind of like glazed over that, but we're currently looking for a space, and yes, the community has been amazing with us, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, we're looking for a space to build. Um, we have a small backer right now, and we're trying to figure out how we can multiply that and how we can get ourselves into a space. So we're just looking everywhere, we're trying to get anything, at, the only thing is, is we're busy cooking. You know, I have one opportunity to, to cook, and it really takes the or to serve, and I basically make about $700 worth to $900 worth of food in one night. 
and then just sell it off. And it's just there's a whole lot that goes on the front end of that, right? And so, yes. You and I have a lot of conversations, both of you. Yes. <laughs> you know, just thought about this. You know, you, you said you're trying to figure out how to multiply that and do that. You guys have a lot of support here in the community. There's a lot of people that really are inspired and believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of people that are around you that would be happy to help contribute to organizing a fundraising event or something like that. Yeah. We've talked about that. We just haven't um, really had a chance to pull team together. Um, I think really our, our biggest concern is moving into a space. Um, and then once that happens, I think that, you know, we can build a team to campaign and kind of see what's, what's next after that. Yes. No, just um, before you move to like a permanent part in you know, location, just want to <coughs> stress the location is really key because another company, very similar to yours, mm -hmm. shut down this past week. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty, uh, pretty sad to have to go away. Perfect. Right? They're not gone though. Uh, they're not gone. They're not completely gone. They're, they're still producing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't want to. Just if if you have heard that the green ingredient is closed, they're not completely closed. I just they're good friends of ours. I wanted to put that out there. They're at the west side still, and they're doing really good at the farmers market. It was just that that the downtown, the construction has just been horrendous on. Yes, you're absolutely right though. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, what's your mission? Why is it that you're you're doing all? Very good. So basically, our mission is access, okay? So it's access on different levels. What we are trying to do is bring access to foods that are not normal or that are not present in El Paso and not and they're good for you. And not only do we want them accessible to those that are paying, but we want them accessible to anybody in town. So we have a pay it forward purpose where we can turn that back on itself. And so plant-based kind of just happened because there was no access to it. Uh, you can't, as a matter of fact, within the last, what, it's been three weeks, I think my wife and I have decided, you know, we're going to do this plant-based thing to see what our clientele is going through. And like, because people come to us like, as if they've been like, climbing through the desert without water, and they're just like, yes, you know, we don't, we don't understand it. We're like, okay, great, the food's good, you know, but it's literally because they don't have anything else. And so this like relief comes upon them. Well, we're learning why. Like it's hard to go out to eat in this town if you're doing that. Do you have any educational component to instead of like just cooking and educating the community how to prepare? Absolutely. In the future, we do. Right now, because we're just limited and we're incubating and we're just trying to capitalize and make money and get into a space so we can hire people and move forward. What we would like to do, we want one grub community to be a, to envelope a couple of different things. We want to include the community not only with their order <coughs> program, but with nutrition, counseling, education, um, work study programs, art programs. What I didn't mention about my wife is actually she's an art student with UTEP that's had to take time off because she's opened a business. But she's an amazing artist and she, we think that arts and fine arts are important for our community, so we would want to integrate that as well. So there's going to be different parts of it. But right now, it's meatless merchants. That's like the line that we're working on. We're building that. We're trying to get this daily up and going. Yes? Oh, well, you're kind of like a charity slash trying to build a business? Yeah, we, we kind of, for lack of better terms, say social entrepreneurship, you know, um, because we're not nonprofit. Um, what the future holds for us, we're t totally open to. Uh, we're not, we play often with the time making the pay it forward system a complete nonprofit thing where it could be separate and uh, we can fundraise for it and grant for it and just like compute and then use our business to just come kind of spread the word to feed people and then to raise money to go to it. We're playing with all that. It, this kind of happened like this and all of a sudden we had a business on our hands and we're developing them to go. So there's ups and there's downs to both of it. Um, but yeah. What does your delicious cheese have in it? Oh yeah, we have we brought food guys, so we brought our we brought our nacho queso, it's our best seller at the farmers market. And it comes in in 12 ounce and 16 ounce containers selling at nine dollars and eleven dollars. It's cashew based. And so basically that's what the whole base is it. So we say cashew seasonings and a little bit of magic is what we say. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get through that. See, do you use any uh, technology for your marketing? Uh, the only marketing that we do is free marketing. 
We have no money. So we do Instagram, Facebook, and uh, just reach out and word of mouth as many people as we got. We're, we're climbing really well. We have over, we're hitting about 1,500 followers on Facebook, and our responses are going really well. And do you use any tools? Any tools? I use the Ripple app. Like to do some like video stuff, but honestly, beyond that, that's I'm a cook, man. So I just kind of like try to see. He had a question. Actually, it was the question about marketing. Okay, great idea. And I'm like, what could I do to help? Yeah, yeah. So if you're not following us on Facebook and Instagram, it's you know that's kind of like the limit of it. Somebody over here. Yeah. What uh, what's your biggest challenge right now? With like Our biggest challenge is working out of the rental kitchen that we're working out of right now. Um, thank goodness that the people that we're doing it with are completely understanding and they let us go whenever we need to and the hours work, but it's just hard to catch. So that is truly our biggest because we can only make so much. I, I feel if I took $1,600 twice the amount of product that I could, I would sell. I think it would sell because we sell before noon and we're, we're out, pre-orders go, people are buying meals and stocking up and and we can't move further, you know? So we're, we're, we're maintaining, we're paying our bills at home. Um, we have the sponsorship that we work with the city and, but it's can't move further because we need our own space where we can be open and serving to the public. Like yes. What do you do in the, the winter time? When it's too cold to uh, grow some of these plants that you know that if you're growing and putting in your food, etc. So, so we don't grow too much of our own food. We just do. We do work with the local farms at the farmers market, though, like La Semilla, um, Sol y Tierra, the Garden of Eden, New Mexico Desert Farms, and uh, and so we are dependent dependent upon them, but we're not completely dependent. We still go to the grocery store. We love the Sprouts sales, you know. We shop, and I, I know how to double at on Wednesday. We're small, and I just, you know, and I've been a chef for 22 years, so you just learn how to be creative with, with sale products and stuff like that. Yes, sir? Have you considered working with another restaurant trying to get the products into there? So can... We've tried that actually right off the bat. That kind of happened with Nosh. If you guys have ever eaten that Nosh EP, so Tara Livingston's the owner there, and she was one of my former students at EPCC. And, um, we, she does meal preps, and so she was kind of picking up some of our meal preps for um, um, the vegan side of stuff. And oh, and she she was using our our um, falafel. We make her falafel mix, and she was featuring it in a in an eggs benedict on Saturdays. And it was going all right. And I think what has happened is that we've gotten busy. She's gotten busy, and as much as we'd like to, she wasn't making much money off of it. She was really just happy that I was doing this. And so I think she made like a quarter off every meal. It was totally like a charity case. And I think it's just become busy. And honestly, we can only make so much. And it's just it's just where we're at. We're stuck. And so we're we're glad that we're maxed out, but but we want to we want to move forward. I was just curious. You kind of mentioned it before. How you grown your network of farmers that you support from? Because most we were talking about. Uh, this would be able to post no matter where they're located. Uh -huh. I was imagining that the agricultural centers in this area are on either side, lower or upper valley. Yeah, so we have, yeah, there's Anthony, there's Sierra Blanca, they go out to Davids, they go into different places. We're just really lucky. I don't know, sometimes, you know, call it what you want, you know, the universe, God, whatever you want to bring it, it just kind of everything just falls in. And as we were building this, this opportunity for the farmer's market co-op sponsorship, came up and so now we have them on speed dial and we cut them their checks at the end of the month. You know, so we get to have a really good conversation with them and you know so yeah. Okay and the final question, what can we as a community do to help you? Uh, one last question. One last chat. Um help us get the word out. Yes, help this is the farmers market. The farmers market, I don't know if you all have been lately, um, it started in two thousand eleven as a farm as an artist market. And then by 2013, they started adding farmers and produce and all that. Um, so it's known. It's it's really heavy. talented, um, you know, entrepreneurs that are that are featuring their their products. So it's a really cool place to um, support that and to uh, uh, support the local economy. 
Yeah, if you all got your phones, you can go to Instagram or Facebook. And just go to at One Girl Community, follow us, give us a share. And I mean, we're just we're taking it as it goes. We're really trying to let the natural flow of this business build. It's, it's, it's a business, but it's also this very social thing, so you have to connect with communities. And, and so we're just kind of letting it naturally. So if you just come along with us, roll with us. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. and educational development, working with the Center for the Arts Entrepreneurship. We're about to be housed at UTEP. And so we're going to have a, um, we do a lot of outreach in the community in nursing home schools. And we bring in young artists from the John Hopkins uh, Peabody Institute, where Zul Bailey went to school. And we um, just go out there in the community. And this, uh, we're going to be having a, it's called Swings for Strings, an under golf tournament, out in Las Cruces on September 29th. And that's going to help support all the efforts to be able to take these residents and artists and take them out to, into the community. So please Great. come out. I'll bring some more information next week. Right, Thank you. How do they find the organization? What's the El Paso Pro Musica? Pro Musica. Uh huh. And for those of us that don't golf, I'm going to start start a nonprofit uh, fundraising shooting tournament. So that's my kind of thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> that for sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's my kind of thing. Okay, next we have the U.S. Green Building Council, West Texas Region, doing their Lunch and Learns. That is Thursday, July 27th, 1130 a.m. to 1230 p.m. here at the Hub. Uh, so if you have any interest, please let us know. Next, a free seminar brought to you by Lift Fund. Why is Human Resources Administration critical? That will be uh, Thursday, July 20th, 6 p.m. to 730 p.m. at Lift Fund's office at 1421 Lee Trevino. Next, the El Paso Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, their Café Pan Dulce, which is uh, at 7.30 a.m. on Friday, July 21st at the Del Sol 
Regional Oncology Center at 10460 Vista del Sol Drive. <clears throat> Next we have the uh, Government Contracting Basics and System for Award Management Registration Process. That's hosted by the Contract Opportunity Center, Wednesday, July 26, 8 a.m. to 12 noon at the El Paso Community College Administrative Offices, 9050-9050 by count, Building B. Uh, another event by the El Paso Hispanic Chamber, Hablemos del Dinero, let's talk about the money. Thursday, July 27th, 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. at the Wells Fargo Bank Bassett location. <coughs> Next, we have the Rio Grande Council of Government and the Hunt Institute. How communities can prepare for the 2020 census, that's very important. A lot of funding and other things are tied to the census. That's Tuesday, August 23rd, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the El City of El Paso Environmental Services Department. 7968 Sao Paulo, that's over by, um, off of Yarbrough. And then finally, Breakfast with Friends Business Networking. It's free to attend, all members welcome. Uh, it's every Thursday, 8.30 a.m. at Carnitas Querétaro, 9077-9077 Gateway Boulevard West. Lastly, da uh, please do follow, download the Downtown Insider. Uh, we're obviously a community member here of Downtown El Paso, so that tells you everything that's happening in Downtown. We do have one, apparently one other community uh, announcement. No, just a heads up for the Hispanic Chamber bundles. If you're not a member, there is a charge, and it's pretty hefty if you go. Uh, it's free the first time, though. Yeah, oh, free the first time. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, with that, you get to give away one of these travel mugs. So here's the question. Who has actually already used the app, the One Million Cups app, to provide uh, presenter feedback? Who's already done that? No? Okay, let's try it. Good thing we have some backup questions. Um, who has told, be honest now, who's told more than 10, mil, 10 people? 10 million. 10, 10 people about 1 million cups. Who's told more than 10? My meeting. Who's? Yes? How many of you told, do you think? I told my cups, so I told 25. 25 people, how many of you tell? I can't tell, I told my meeting. So. Okay, I didn't agree to give this one. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. All right, um, last couple of announcements. Please make sure you do sign in before you leave. If you didn't sign in on the way in, please do so on the way out. It's very important that we collect this attendance information and give it back to Kaufman and other people that are supporting this. Also, if you parked in the front of the building, make sure you reverse in. Otherwise, you will get a ticket. And part of that parking is only one hour. So if you parked in that, you may want to, have to go down and move the, the vehicle. Uh, with that, we'll bring up our second presenter, uh, Viesca's Research Media and Instruction. Woo! I believe in coffee culture, I believe in small business and combination working hand in hand. Um, I'm here today because there's a gentleman in the back of the room named Adam Marshall, who we probably see on a regular basis here, who told me about these presentations about five months ago when some of these ideas I was working on were still gaining some traction and I was doing some research behind them. Uh, so when I applied about a month ago to speak, I, I, the timing couldn't have come at a better time uh, because I was just in Phoenix last week. And I was trying to present some of what I was talking about, but I realized, why am I presenting to an outsider when I should be in, in El Paso? Okay, so I found the previous presentations, y'all agree, excellent, excellent decision making, excellent model of a community vision. You use social entrepreneurship and community impacts, and you're promoting nutrition, like layer upon layer of impacts. And I believe, as you all will probably agree, that you come out of a tradition of it. You know, on one level, uh, El Paso is very unique because we're family driven, right? What is unique about El Paso? We're, we're safe, we promote uh, what traditional values in some cases, at the same time we're progressive, we have a really rich cultural history. We're, there's other components of this, but one of them is that all El Pasoans are about two degrees of separation away from each other, right? So I taught your kid at Cathedral or Community College, or I did some volunteer service that you did, did as well, and we worked together in the diocese or in some faith based group. Or you're a board member and I've intersected something with you when we're serving youth. Or you're in small business development and you started something five or ten years ago. Or you're a filmmaker in the background doing a bunch of different projects. Or you're a coder or you're doing something cool. Or you're a political and you're trying to gauge uh, the awareness of the community. You're trying to collect data. You're trying to mobilize volunteers. What I find fascinating is that we give a lot in terms of philanthropy, correct? Some donors more than others. Uh, able, 
the back is an extraordinary philanthropist, and he doesn't just give his treasure, he gives his time on multiple boards. And he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And most, most of you do as well. Talk about paying it forward. Your presentation a moment ago. It's a form of social capital, right? Sharing our resources, mobilizing others. You said you cook the food, you don't deal with marketing, but it's a social engagement model where your friends, I know Terry. Terry Livingston's is cousins with Anthony Flotis, who his family knows, owns all the restaurants, and you guys eat there at used to Dallas. And I've seen you downtown, I've seen you at the cafes, you've probably bumped into each other the last 10 years. Anyway, what I'm trying to get at here is that all of us volunteer. All of us give, most of us do this hundreds of hours a year. Or you're, you're kind of volunteering because your friend's doing something new and you're helping. Or there's that one special event in a year. Somebody mentioned a golf tournament. You're in, you're in the back uh, with a bunch of other young volunteers or older uh, family members or, or wives and spouses and so forth that are helping make sure that the event is perfect. And they do two days of work. The day of the event, the day before the event. And then, of course, everyone else who gives to make sure that there's prizes and other opportunities. We come together as a community. And from my standpoint, that is power. That is a form of capital that we are disregarding. Many of us know a local Apaches who build their fortunes off of scrap metal and recycling. Yes? Seeing something that others don't perceive as valuable and magnifying, growing wealth. And you could be from a generational family, you could be from Lebanon or Syria or some other internal part of Mexico or somewhere else, and you can get started here. And that is the history of El Paso. And your family, your neighbors, and your friends and so forth will make that possible. If you want to start a small business or a new initiative, and you know what I'm talking about, Adam, there is a network of people in El Paso that's ready to do that. Not all communities have this. And so, once again, trying to talk to an outsider about what's normal in El Paso, I'd rather begin here. Um, <clears throat> I think my graphic went away. Uh, other communities in Texas sit on top of huge reserves of uh, what, natural gas and oil and so forth. I think New Mexico and the whole reason why we encouraged the, uh, uh, the incorporation of massive Texas along the Rio Grande was to get access to silver in New Mexico, right? In El Paso, we have tremendous reserves of talent. We have a young population. We have an influx of transnational people. We have people that are one or two degrees of separation away in other metros and around the world that still remain connected to us. We have tourism, and it's growing. But in the end, what I'm trying to say is that there's other subsectors, audiences, students, displaced students, potential homeowners, future entrepreneurs, and they're kind of being under-recognized. I think you all agree with this. And some of us take on causes to benefit their nutrition, to offset diabetes and early onset diabetes or to, to provide support for Special Olympics, so we take on the healthcare costs. I've historically tried to work with students to keep them in school, to get them into, into college, and to get them ready for grad school, and so on and so forth, but ultimately, it's also all trying to make a case where when you leave, you need to come back here and make a difference. If our school systems and our families, our neighbors, and our taxpayers invested in you, you should invest in them. I came back here 10 years ago, 2007, I based myself out of a Union Fashion Building, Downtown was totally different back then, if you all recall. And I did a project called the El Paso Expatriate Project. A few others were involved, and some of you came down to the celebration too. It's still going, because the phenomenon